as so you wish. I would be in the middle, yeah, you can sit. Yeah, excellent. Would you want to sit here? There we go. We are fine. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, you're doing the part of uh, saving the time on a very short slot that we're going to have here with the speakers. Uh, we'll repeat just once again. My great pleasure to be here with Laurent Mignon, Chief Executive Officer, BPCE, and Patrick Pione, CEO at Total Energies. Now, the format of this dialogue is the fireside chat. We're going to have 30 minutes for a conversation with the speakers here on stage. As usual, this is all streamed, of course, live, and you have the possibility to watch it from here and from online. Gentlemen, great to have you here on stage. Thanks so much for being here, and absolutely great to, to be back in person at Paris Euro Place. We have had the fireside chat like three years ago exactly, it was 2019, right before the pandemic struck, and this is one of the things that we are discussing today here during the day, when we are talking about building and reinforcing the European economy, making it stronger. We are also reflecting on what is this new world where we have found ourselves now in 2022, we are hopefully already in post-pandemic stage, hopefully this is the post one, uh, but still not 100% out of there yet, of course, with massive disruptions that we have all observed and felt and lived through over the past couple of years. Now, when we are talking about the new world and the new reality, now the first question to set the scene for this chart, I want to ask you both, how is the current situation different from before and what are the most significant changes as of now for your respectful businesses. Do you want to start? You have the mic? Well, yeah, <laughs> if you want, thank you. Uh, well, very happy to be here with you, thank you, and very happy to discuss with Patrick about this subject. Um, well, what has changed? Many things have changed, as you know, through the pandemic situation, and, and uh, uh, we've been changing uh, many, I mean, digital transformation has accelerated significantly through the pandemic. Uh, and also the the understanding of the tradition and the ecological tradition, the uh, the energetical tradition has accelerated during the pandemic, even if it has, in fact, uh, no reality between the two. But the fact that there have been uh, a, a sanitary crisis that touched the full world has probably made that the people were have been more aware that they could be. Uh, element that can affect their life even if they didn't think it could. And, and I think that that has accelerated this uh, sentiment that the uh, transition for uh, 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 decarbonization of the uh, uh, economy has in rise during this period. So we're, we're getting out of this COVID crisis with, um, I would say, a higher need of uh, uh, investing in this transition. At the same time, and I think that what the, the war in Ukraine has uh, in, increased is we've seen significant disruption in many areas. Uh, uh, you've talked about supply chain, but we've seen also the raise of, uh, um, of uh, uh, raw materials with uh, commodities and significant inflation. The question after the pandemic was to know whether inflation was a transition one or not a transition one, uh, and I think, or, or uh, let's say structural or conjunctural, and uh, my view is that, uh, uh, and now I think uh, uh, the view of, of, of most of the people, but it was not the case a year ago, is that it is more structural for two main reasons. The first one is that the pandemic has shown, and it has started, in fact, f uh, before that, a, a sort of a slowdown to a stop, probably, to uh, the uh, globalization that we've seen before, uh, 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 the, through the last 30 years that has pushed price down for years and years, and we see that there's a comeback to some sort of regionalization, which imp in implicitly due to either geopolitical issues or even uh, 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 ecological issues, has will keep price to a higher standard to what they are today. And the second big change is that the, the need of transition uh, uh, of, of uh, energy transition is also an element that will push price higher, boost price of energy, because I don't think that we plan well the uh, um, the supply, the, the the demand to supply uh, adequation in oil and gas specifically, and I think probably uh, we underestimate the need of oil and gas and how long we will need an oil and gas during this period, and also the cost of uh, changing the industrial process of the full industry means huge investment and that will 
drive higher price. So this is really the new world in yeah. which we live, uh, uh, where we need to take climate change as a real priority, a real change. But this is a world where inflation, I think, has stable uh, has appear as being a, a, an element of, of that. And, and part of that is linked to the uh, decarbonization of the economy. Right. Uh, Mr. Pena, are we underestimating the importance and the need for oil and gas and energy? What's the new world and new reality for you for Total Energies? So, uh, if I'm coming back, I would have answered more or less like uh, Laurent, no surprise. First, uh, it reveals the fragility of the planet, uh, the COVID. It reveals... Uh, the fragility of our just-in-time global system, where suddenly uh, you discover that uh, if goods do not travel from India to Europe, you don't have enough medicines or things like that. So uh, we have built during 30 years a perfect just-in-time global world, and suddenly you disrupt it, and it does not work anymore. Uh, of course, none of us had anticipated such a disruption like the COVID, you know, a global pandemic, a world pandemic. So, of course, it's obliged to think about it. Then you have the second crisis, which is the Ukrainian-Russian crisis, which has added, I will see, two elements from me. First, uh, of course, the fragility of planets means the imperative of climate change. I will not come back of what, on what Laurent has raised. And, for, and at the same time, what we observe with the crisis is two other elements. There again, uh, on the geopolitical side, the global world is clearly into question because we have based, uh, in fact, the way we have global lead the globalization with the idea that trade uh, will lead to peace. And suddenly Mr. Putin tells us, no, it's not true. I don't care about trade. I don't care about your investments. Uh, geopolitics are more important. And so you, you come back to the old historic way to look to geopolitical powers clashing with something which is even, for me, more complex to analyze and fundamentally more uh, for our Western countries, because what we observe is that this debate between democracies and autocracies, you can observe that uh, it's not only Russia and China, it's more than that, it's Russia, China, India, Middle East, Africa, uh, which is looking to the Western world, uh, you know, this war is your war, it's maybe not our war, we don't want to contribute or to support, so that's something which is very important in terms of accelerating, I would say, the... The, the thinking and the deglobalization of our world. And the second one is also, of course, for me, important, and uh, that's why probably Laurent is speaking so well about oil and gas, which I'm not sure we would have spoken like that two years ago, is that, in fact, this um, crisis is rebalancing the energy debate, the energy dialogue, fundamentally. You know, the energy debate is about three pillars, normally. Uh, availability, security of supply, affordability, price, costs, and sustainability, climate. Clearly, since 2015 and acceleration since 2019, the climate part of the energy debate has dominated our thinking for a very fundamental mm. reason. We need to find a way to exit for decarbonized energy. But today, with the Russian crisis, we re rebalance this debate because suddenly what is in front of us from the customer's point of view is clearly affordability, and they are all shouting, even in our developed world, so I don't tell you what happens in emerging world, which de desperately needs more energy, and also security of supply, which seems obvious to us. And today we have questions marks. So these three elements are for me are very fundamental of any energy policies. So maybe what I hope is that yes, we need to rebalance. And in fact, it's fundamental. The world transition sometimes is forgotten. But the world energy transition, transition is fundamental. Transition, it means that, uh, if I was listening to Jacques before, I think first, and this is for me the big priority for the next decade, we need to invest much more than what we do. The IES say four trillion per year, where we are at two trillion per year, four trillion dollars per year, the new decarbonized system. And as long, I don't know if it's 80 percent, but at least 50 percent of the energy system is not decarbonized. It's super dangerous, so it's even against our global interest to begin to destroy the energy of today, which is fossil fuel, which is only gas. Uh, and even coming back to coal, this is what is happening. Why? Because we do not invest enough. And there is something very wrong in the debate. People think that if we change the supply, then we'll change the demand. No, it does not work like that. You know, if we don't change the way that planes or ships are driven today, we don't change the demand. So we have to invent, to innovate to technology in the, on the demand side for energy. And otherwise, 
what will adapt to the supply, which is a lower supply to the demand, is the price. And this is exactly what we observe. And if the price of the energy of today is too expensive, and if you are adding on it the cost of the energy transition, it becomes unbearable for the customers. So I think this is a lesson. For, me, for us, of course, it's very fundamental yeah. shift for my company. And, but I would say it has two impacts for me, what I just described. The first one is it fundamentally validates our strategy, which is based on two pillars, gas and renewables. So renewables, nobody is, is asking me. You know, we have, by the way, in the last three years, I moved up from one billion per year to four billion per year, which is a huge increase. Multiply by four, we are one of the main players, in fact, in the renewable world today. But at the same time, we continue to spend money First, to continue to develop the gas, because gas is a transition fuel, and maybe this is something that, you know, there was this debate in Europe about taxonomy, uh, yep. nuclear against gas, against uh, transition. In fact, we need gas with nuclear to make the transition possible. That's the reality of our Europe today, if we want to keep Europe to be strong in the, in the economic contest. And so I think that validates our strategy. It even reinforced me, my, my will to continue to move on, including the fact that I know that we, yes, we need to continue to invest in some uh, competitive greenfield oil project because I need to con we need to continue to bring the oil to the planet. Otherwise, look, Mr. Biden begins to accuse the U.S. oil companies to be to organize a scarcity of oil. You know, in fact, we are accused to spend too much money on oil. So we have to choose policymakers. It's one or the other. It cannot be both. And the other consequence of what I said before, of course is uh, globalization, and it, I think it's a new approach probably of the geopolitical risk in our company. Uh, what happens today obliges us to revisit some investments that we are doing in some, not only Russia, it's not an yeah. issue, That's but what I wanted to countries. ask. So yeah, I think yeah. it has, and that probably is more fundamental change for me rather than my energy transition, yeah. which I'm even more comforted in the way we structure our strategy. So these new disruptions and the new aspects, they are forcing you, I mean, Already you had the priorities set up for your company, but what are so some of these changes that the new disruption makes you shape up the new and the, 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 the future strategy still with all the adjustments for your... Yeah, but for example, it's clear to me what I said to on my shareholders is more, more US and less Russia, I would say, but not, not only Russia. It's less, I would say, the way we will approach investments in some countries yeah. will be obviously... Uh, uh, we have to take into account the fact that there might be a sort of new uh, Cold War, not only between Europe and Russia, but more generally between powers, geopolitical powers. And so where we will put our money as a Western company is, of course, we have to take that dimension into account. Uh, again, by the way, for me, it's not uh, when I look to what are the big renewable and electricity market for the future, it's Europe, it's the U.S., it's China. So China probably will not be a strong one. By the way, it's difficult to be strong in China. But I will, it will rebalance my portfolio towards the, the country that has Europe and the US. How are these changes reshaping your strategy? Well, I think, um, uh, as I mentioned, and I think uh, Patrick stressed it very well, uh, w w during the last 30 years, geopolitical issues were not included in corporate strategy. Uh, most of the time, uh, except a few countries where you see it, more risky countries, but there was no logic about geopolitical. Every It was an open world. This is not true anymore. So we have to think about it when we think about where do we go, where do we fund projects, how do we move that. So that's a uh, uh, first point. Number two, and I think what um, uh, Patrick mentioned is, is, is absolutely true, is we have to talk about transition. And transition is bringing from one stage to the other, and we have to do that on an orderly manner in order not to create too much disruption at the consumer side, huh? because and the people, and how they live about, uh, uh, and, and this is really something that needs to be done. We need to, I mean, transition doesn't mean don't act. Yeah. Huh? Transition means act, but act with a goal, with a, a, an objective, and that's why I think that there is a, a, a great uh, a need, and I think it's moving the right direction for government to set clear targets in order to make sure that we have something which is compatible with uh, the, the, the speed to which the industry, the provider of energy can adapt themselves 
and then we can adapt the fact that consumer will follow. So transition to us is a key word, and we've been, uh, um, and that's why we keep on funding and and and, and doing uh, uh, business with uh, Total Energy. Not because you know some people will say, well, you should uh, reduce your your uh, scope three in terms of funding uh, and by g getting out of any sort of uh, non uh, uh, green. Asset. We think it's wrong. We, if we want to have a transition, we need to fund the transition. If we, we need to go to a decarbonized industry, we need to fund the transition. And, and Total Energy is certainly one of the co companies that invest the most in green energy, at the same time that it provides some oil and gas to that. So that for us, transition is a key word. Let's go now into the sort of a second part of this chat when we can also focus a little bit on the Imperia recommendations from the report because this is something that you have just touched upon as well when it comes to the need for certain targets and very certain strategies and policies. But let me bring you into the importance of equilibrated dialogue between all the parties when it comes to that. Yeah, well, I think we have the discussion with Eve when he made he was working on the report and uh, um, uh, and I'm chairing the uh, 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 FBF uh, 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 Sustainability uh, Climate uh, 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 Commission. Um, so it, it is an important issue. Uh, I think that to organize a dialogue between the three parties that are the most involved into the transition, which is government, in order to set some sort of rules and targets, industry, which is the one that is going to make the transition, and finance, finance. one way or the other, which is the one that will fund it, I think is important. If you only make uh, um, uh, finance by itself, it's not enough. Uh, uh, if fin finance can can do the job huh, uh, by themselves. They can channel the fund the right way, but they, it needs to be the right way. We can't, by ourselves and our own position, uh, uh, decide what is the way to forward. So we need to have that dialogue between the three parties. And I think that one of the uh, 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 suggestions of the uh, uh, Yves Perrier, of the Perrier uh, report and, and the creation of this Institute for uh, 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 Durable Finance is probably the right way to do it. Uh, we really need to create that uh, area where there will be, uh, let's say, a grown-up dialogue between the three parties. And I think it's, it's, it's important. What's your take on this? Um on this dial, because this is something that has been discussed quite a lot. But now, do you feel that the do you feel the uh, the sense about the importance of this dialogue changed and improved, so to say? No, I think I, I welcome a lot the idea that uh, people should be around the same table. Uh, honestly, since the last uh, three four years, I'm very surprised that uh, people uh, are working between themselves. You know, financial institutions between themselves, influenced by some experts. We, as energy companies, are never considered as experts, but as devils, so we don't have the right to say anything, uh, which is absolutely just uh, incredible. I was happy yesterday, somebody uh, at their site told me, finally, you were maybe right with your strategy on gas, but you know, things, I mean, and, and I think that the fact that we, so I think I welcome a lot, and by the way, Mr. De Bresson, if you really put in place your strategic string body, you should invite Total Energy. Don't worry, we will not, uh, We'll, not, uh, we'll just take our seat. Uh, no, but I think it's important because there is no way to find a, a balanced transition if we don't have all the voice. That's not bit that we are right and others are wrong. It's just that you need to have a balanced dialogue and something which is not fully only emotional and ideological, as this debate is, is today. And in fact, it's quite frustrating not to be able to have the right to say something. Look, the demand is growing, the supply is declining. Why is the demand is growing? Just because the population is growing in the planet. This morning in the newspaper, 8 billion people by 2030. And we are seven. What do you want to do? We want to deprive of energy all this uh, population of emerging countries. So this is maybe a selfish way to look to the planet, but it will not happen like that. So I think we need to face reality. We need to have a balance and a, not, not an emotional dialogue. So I, I would like to participate and to contribute. And I think also that in the, in the report, there was also a very important remark for me. The world, you know, we have today a regulated world, which are the listed companies, over-regulated. And you have a absolutely unregulated market, which is a privately owned companies, which is growing. You have also, by the way, the state-owned companies. When you speak about energy transition, if you exclude the state-owned companies, which are producing more than 70% of the oil and gas, by the way, just for 
just for everybody should know the facts, and we are considered major companies, but the four or five majors, we have only 10% market share of the oil and gas business, not more. It's a state-owned company. And the privately-owned company are also very important, but what happens today under the pressure in the North Sea, not far from us? My colleagues, we are, and us, we are divesting to, PE comp to private equity companies. They have no regulation, no scope one, no scope three, nothing. And the world is just moving. So we'll have, at a, at a certain point, a strange world with listed companies, super green, and also black energy to be handled in an unregulated world. So I think uh, Perrier report is putting the finger on it. I think it's just fundamental. Otherwise, the climate will not benefit of it, you know, if we just transfer assets uh, to an unregulated world. So I think that uh, that was my two comments on the report. I could elaborate more, but I think it's important. These two, the dialogue between all the parties and the real way to work together, plus the fact that we should have, uh, I would say, a holistic view and approach, and not only uh, looking to some few players, because they are very large and rich, I would say, and of forgetting what will happen. What will happen is what I just described, a sort of... Uh, black market of the oil and gas. I'm not sure this is good for the climate, a lack of transparency. Yes, uh, well, and, and listed or not listed banks are very regulated, and it's not only the listed. No, it's why yeah. we share the same, no, <laughs> yeah, we are yeah. both. But, uh, <laughs> and, and so, they, they, but I do agree, it's between regulated company and non-regulated company, where that, that's the question. And I think it's really um, also, uh, uh, um, uh, the sh the, the, the goal should be for everybody, whatever the stake and the situation, and not only because there is pressure during uh, general meetings between uh, the fact that when you issue bond to, to the uh, external world, it should be the same that should be said. And that's why this dialogue between government that set rules uh, uh, um, uh, and, and sometimes owned companies, uh, uh, um, the private sector, the industry, and the uh, finance world, including banks, is important. There is another point that was mentioned by Eve, and I think is important, is the ability to measure and to, to, to have the right uh, sort of uh, extra financial accounting. Uh, and this is very important because for the time being, uh, we are talking about many things. We are trying to align ourselves. Uh, I mean, we are part of the N NZBA initiative where we're measuring our, 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 the degrees of our funding in our balance sheet uh, today, we are 3.2. We have an objective to, to be at 2.5 in, in 2024. But honestly, uh, uh, how is, is this measure appropriate? Is, is the way we do and we compare it to other uh, parties, is it appropriate? We're not, we don't know. Uh, uh, and, and, and so I think it is very important that we've got credible data, credible way to account, and at least the same. Uh, we've worked a lot during the, uh, within the FBF in order to have convergence methodology during, within French Bank, as much convergent with the international, uh, uh, yeah, because we, we cannot see that. And it is not a, I mean, climate change is not a French issue. Right? It's, it's a global issue. So we need to make sure that it is uh, uh, coherent with what the uh, international standards are, are, are doing. But for me, this is very important. If you don't measure things, it's very difficult to to measure how much you progress and how much we, we move forward. And there is another aspect which I wanted to ask you both about when it comes to the importance of this dialogue. Another aspect here is the need for the clear guidance on what the sector's objectives must be. But here, interesting uh, aspect, not only on national level in France, which is important, but also then on the EU level, a bigger one, the, to have those clear objectives and to use this dialogue to, to get a better understanding of those. Because that's another aspect, isn't it? Well, obviously, again, it's not... I mean, it's French all the components. Fight climate change, that the climate change will stop if we only manage it at the French level. Nevertheless, <laughs> each time you add complexity, you, you, you make it more difficult. So we need to... There is international standard that we should be adopting. Then I think to have a dialogue on the French scene is, u is useful because it's one way to start to have this, this dialogue. Then it can move up to the European space. And, and that's part of the, uh, uh, we can create new instance for that. Yeah, something on which uh, I disagree with the report is a dream because it's a link to the measurement that we should have one scenario to get to net zero. This idea that you want all in the financial world, a very simplified world with a new Bible, which gives you one scenario to measure is for me 
just import, I mean, it's a big mistake. There are several ways, by the way, uh, in the IPCC report to go to net zero. I think there are 70 different scenarios. Of course, we want to measure, so we simplify. So today you have a new Bible, which is the IA scenario, which is just absolutely wrong. And nobody wants to look to the scenario seriously. It's completely wrong because this scenario is based on a linear decrease and 30% less demand for oil in 2030. I will tell you, it will never happen. But you are all willing to take this scenario as your new fundamental scenario. I think, and this is another simplification of the problematic of climate change. And you know, when in my company, uh, if I give some directives which are oversimplified, my colleagues will go in that direction, but I can tell you the result could be very difficult. There is another effect. If you s use um, an objective which is unreachable, like this one, because it's absolutely unreachable to reduce by 30% the old demand by 2030, it's impossible. Because people do not realize what it means. All the light vehicles of the planet, all of them, all the cars, they represent 15% of oil. And we only plan, in Europe only, to shift them from oil, from gasoline to EV by 2035. So somebody should tell me where the reduction by 30% of the oil demand will come in eight years now. I want to say, but so I'm tired and honestly and frustrated to be obliged to justify what we do against a scenario which has absolutely no validity. The end point of the IES scenario is right. The 2050 target is right. The, the, the roadmap to go there, which is just yeah. a, nuclear, a linear line, is completely wrong. And so I'm, 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 I think that the idea that it's, it seems easy, but I'm ready to, to, to act and to justify our strategy and to enter into that dialogue if we manage to have on the table a basis. So maybe some people want to have this new linear scenario, but let's take two or three scenarios and, and let's discuss the fundamental assumptions. And so I will continue to fight. And when people ask me, justify your strategy against the IS scenario, I think we'll stop to answer. By the way, we have answered in our sustainability and climate report by just explaining what we think about the scenario. We agree on the end point. The trajectory is just will not happen. And, and, and so that's the type of, type of things which, for me, maybe I'm too rational and not enough, uh, that we should, investors, financial investors, regulators, energy or corporation sit around the table and not just be governed again by emotion uh, yes it is a case because somebody told it by the way he never said that he said and it was it was a demand scenario which was uh, very interesting the only point which was the right thing of this scenario was okay if we want to reach that point in 2050 the demand should decrease by 30 percent and people transfer translate the demand by the supply <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if the demand does not decrease and we decrease the supply by 30%, I will tell you we'll not pay $150 per barrel, but $500 per barrel, you know? So I think this is where, so this is uh, oversimplification might be uh, a risk for all of us. Yes. On the other side, uh, Patrick, we also need to have some metric to measure in order to see progress. And that's, that's what is important. Um, and metrics that are similar during the different players so that we can measure and compare. That's, that, I think, is important uh, if we I want to move. I agree on uh, this one. That, that, Even that if you scope free yeah. of an energy company and yeah. scope free of well, uh, yeah, but then it's, a it's not at true. all the same way to measure true. it. Is it the customer, the supplier? Yeah. You know, the, it's, right. Because, by the way, the scope free, it's normal. It's a strange yeah. animal, which is uh, all what is happening around us. Uh, but what so, is important but I is value. I fully agree. Yeah, I fully agree, but yeah. again, in a... In a sector, we should be the investor yeah. should be able to compare and to compare the progress. Exactly. Not to know if the progress is validated against I don't know which trajectory, which by the way is super complex to evaluate. Thank you so much. And that was such a good example now about exactly the dialogue that's needed and the conclusions. You know, that's that's the argument that brings the the result and the conclusion. Thanks so much to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Excellent. Laurent Mignon, Chief Executive Officer, BPC, and Patrick Pony, CEO of Total Energies. Thank you so much to the speakers. And I want to tell you briefly that the program goes on and ahead. We're going to have parallel partners workshops.
focusing on sustainability and then on crypto. Stay tuned. <laughs>